All right. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, this is Professor Fanticero. I'm coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. I would normally have addressed you from Addis Ababa, but I have to evacuate myself a few days ago because of the deteriorating uh, political situation in the, in the country. Uh, let me first of all uh, thank my longtime friend, Professor Jimmy Adesina, for inviting me to give this inaugural address. It is a tall order to try to give a talk on the intellectual contributions of Tandika Makandewere to the social sciences. He covered so many timely and important topics in the field of development. His work was cumulative and exhaustive for me to be able to summarize and discuss them in the time allotted to me today. I also want to thank uh, Jimmy Adesina for carrying the transformative social policy torch, a topic so close to the heart of our late colleague Tandika Makandewere. This is a topic that Tandika theorized deeply and subsequently built one of the most successful research programs during his tenure as director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development in Geneva. Tandika dedicated his time in grounding theoretically the transformative role of social policy. This particular theoretical journey into the social policy came after his groundbreaking work on the harmful effect of structural adjustment programs. While others such as Sir Richard Jolly and Giovanni Adria in Rome uh, at UNICEF had started to take a critical look at structural adjustment program and came up with the idea of adjustment with the human face, Tandika took theorizing on the transformative role of social policy to the next level once he arrived at UNRIST in 2009. It is really difficult to think of a scholar who is driven, as Tandika was, on the imperatives of promoting development in Africa. Because of his lived experience and encounter with colonial rule, he was a free nationalist, a pan-Africanist, and anti-imperialist. Because of his demeanor, the way of speaking, one would not suspect that he carries all these admirable uh, levels. It was not only the radicals who always sought his wisdom and critical perspective on any topic, but also the conservatives conservative academics and politicians who disagreed with him on so many issues but still seek his acquaintance. The more he provokes them, the more he demolishes their distorted worldview, the more they actually want to engage him in a debate. He was an amazing storyteller, he was a voracious reader and interested about everything under the sun. More importantly, he had a fine sense of humor, loved to have a good time uh, with friends. My talk today is primarily concerned around the many memorable conversations I had with uh, Tandika over the last four years. We lived in the same town, but very rarely we saw each other because when when I'm out of the country, he is in Sweden. When he's out of the country, I'm in Sweden. So rarely, but this moment where we meet which was just uh, precious. I think the last of those lunch meeting I had with him was on December 6, 2018. Little did I know that over the subsequent months, his health was to deteriorate. The talk of my, the title of my talk today is quote, entitled, Resuscitating the Aborted National Project retrospective and prospective view, a topic that Tandika had written and spoken about. I chose to use the term aborted instead of unfinished national project deliberately. My aim is to show the interconnectedness between the notion of democracy, development, independence, the centrality of the state in transformative politics under an overarching theme of what I call the nationalist project. These themes are rooted in Makandawere's deep thinking on the national project and its future. I purposely use the term aborted to imply that our present politics is disembedded 
from our rich history. That is a history of resistance, a history of pan-Africanism, and a history of anti-imperialism. I sometimes feel that the current generation are completely disconnected from this rich legacy of, of the founding fathers. We live a very interesting times and I wish Tandika was alive to deconstruct many of the contradictory tendencies in global politics. We are experiencing tectonic, tectonic shift on many fronts, political, economic, social, ecological. These contradictory shifts have a strong bearing on the trajectory of African development and more particularly on transformative and emancipatory national projects. So as a scholar and practitioner and a critique, I'm trying hard to unlearn what I have learned, which is difficult to do. Given the complexity in global politics, we need to break away from our own disciplinary ghettos and try to look at things very differently. Tandika thought coherently. He rejected disciplinary boundaries. It is increasingly obvious for us now that we need really new politics, we need new analytical narratives in order to achieve structural change, in order to achieve a whole new emancipatory nationalist project. For us Africans to embark on the task of writing a new history, we must go back and re-examine the past. We need to pose a retrospective and prospective view. For me personally, it means revisiting the visions and aspirations of the aborted nationalist project, forced self-determination and independence, underpinned by a broad-based quest for African renaissance and unity of the African people. To quote Adebayo Adedeji, the former head of ECA, I quote, he said, a society which forgets the instructive value of its past for it is present and future cannot be self-confident and self-reliant and will therefore lack internally generated dynamism and stability. There's the need to have this retrospective and prospective views in terms of the future. Is there anything we can learn from our history? Can we go back to the nationalist project? What is the objective of the nationalist project? In this context, let me sh start by recounting the objectives, achievements, shortcomings of the first nationalist project of the late 1950s and 1960s, whose aim was to overcome the institutional legacies of colonialism. And inspired by the political thinking of early nationalist leaders, such as Kwame Nkrumah, Modibo Keita, Seki Toure, and many others, African countries embarked upon programs of nation building, national development designed to bring the fruits of social and economic growth to all sectors of the population. So for the early nationalist leaders, self-determination was a precondition for realizing all human rights, particularly the right to development. So the nationalist project was therefore a strategy for more equitable appropriation of the productive forces at the local, continental, and global levels. It involves basically a deliberate state intervention to strengthen national political capacity in the face of the polarizing logic of world order, which undermines such capacity. So further inspired by the spirit of the 1955 Bandung Conference on Non-Aligned Nations, the nationalist leaders also joined by other newly independent countries from Asia and Latin America called for a new international economic order under the auspices of the United Nations. Though little progress has been made since 1975, African countries remain fully engaged in the struggle for reforming the global governance architecture. So in the early 1960s, 1970s, as a result of these state, deliberate state actions, African economies registered impressive growth rates given the initial conditions at the time of independence. Physical infrastructure were greatly improved, particularly in the areas of health, education, communication, new universities, agricultural research centers, national transport network, 
a local government structure was established to facilitate the national development project. Since the early 1980s, however, this mood is dispelled by increased level of poverty, social disintegration, and political instability. So the spectacular political economic progress registered during the first decade and a half of independence is now a distant memory. Instead, the balance turned again, once again, shifted in favor of nations and social classes, which are best placed to profit from the polarizing logic of the world order. In short, the politics of inclusion that was central to the nationalist project had been overtaken by the politics of exclusion. Let me stop right here at this point and a word of caution is in order. Let me not over glorify the nationalist project. There were problems at, 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 at many levels. Uh, among the many contradictions that Tandika pointed out, I'll focus just on, on three of them. First was this whole emphasis, the need to maintain national sovereignty and nation building were high in the agenda. Even if that means dismissing the existence of deep divisions and cleavages based on ethnicity, gender and class and religion. So ethnicity and tribalism were officially banished, while in practice they were the main criteria for distributing public resources in exchange for social groups' recognition of the authorities in power. Tandika referred to this practice, quote, nationalist by day, tribalist by night. The nationalist discourse basically, as I say, denied these ethnic claims. It denied subnationalism. It denied the existence of tribes. That's the first contradiction. The second contradiction has to do with that class analysis were never fully embraced by a nationalist movement. Instead, the focus was became on ending past forms of racial and horizontal inequalities without transforming the old order. There's policies such as indigenization, Africanization, black economic empowerment, as in the case of South Africa, were uploaded very much praised in the face of growing intra-group inequality. That was again the second contradiction. The third contra contradiction also was the central assumptions of the African Nationalist Project of the 1950s and 1960s were the centered around the idea of what I call industrialization by invitation, that it is possible and that it is ach its achievement is dependent upon the maintenance of intimate link with the former colonial powers. That, of course, led to the division, if you recall, to the so-called Casablanca group and the Monrovia group during the formations of the uh, Organization of African Unity. So there were certain contradictions with the nationalist movement. However, in total, I think they did achieve quite a significant amount uh, in the economic and social areas, despite all these contradictions in the 19, uh, during that period. But what really contributed then to the premature demise of the nationalist project? Certainly there has been contradiction both in the independence struggle itself, in the post-independence experience with development and nation building, the post-1980s experience with market-oriented or reform dominated by the policy of structural adjustment, and later in the post-1990 experience with liberal democracy. In each phase there has always been contradiction. So I think already halfway into the first decade of independence, many commentators were sounding alarm bells that the politics of inclusion is being overtaken by the politics of exclusion. Publications like Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, Basil Davidson's Which Way Africa, René Dumont's 1965 book False Start in Africa, Ojinga Odinga's 1967 book Not Yet Uhuru, and many others elaborated on how things were moving in the wrong direction. What, how else can you really explain the fact that one African dictator after another extend their hold on power through the ballot box with increasing regularity today? However, the conventional wisdom about Africa 
is that the continent is marginalized because it is not sufficiently integrated into the capitalist, capitalist global economy or pat, you know, patrimonialism is rife and goes against entrepreneurship and capitalist accumulation. Both assumptions have been refuted by Makandawere in many of his writings. To the contrary, I take the position that a proper understanding of Africa's marginal position must be put in a broader context, particularly in the context of North-South relation. In addition to the crisis of leadership, which I have just elaborated at the national level, there were bad rules, unjust trade agreement, illegitimate debt, and bad, bad policies imposed by, on Africa by the institutions of the world system have produced multiple black holes of social exclusion, pockets of slums, and disabled nation state. If there is anything pervasive about the presence of the past, it is this lack of freedom to maneuver, the ever-shrinking policy space we have to recognize. Claude Ake agreed with me on this. In his last writing before his tra tragic death, he argued, I quote, it's not that development has failed in Africa. It has never begun. Because of exogeneity, Africa never had a development agenda, but a confusion of agenda. In a sense, he then called upon all of us to challenge and subvert the constraint of dominant and receive disciplinary approaches and paradigm, a sentiment also shared by Macanduere. So as Africa entered the decade of the 1970s, the nationalist project was being threatened from within and from without, whether political independence was achieved through direct negotiation or through the barrel of the gun, the nationalist leaders came into the world stage in a very unfavorable political and economic environment and with little room to maneuver. Consequently, pragmatic accommodation to the inherited international system that became a preferred solution than a revolution or delinking. Only a handful of African countries set out to transform their economies from external domination by promoting self-reliance strategy, but with limited success, as in the case of Tanzania and a couple of other countries. The nationalist project was also undercut by poor political governance as an unaccountable political elite, often supported by competing Western powers let loose their predatory instinct in indulging corruption, abuse of office, and repression. As the African military emerged as the sole conductor of state politics in many parts of Africa from the 1970s onward, the nationalist project took a different direction. So the whole thing, the, the, the emphasis became power over welfare, personal over institutional consideration, national unity, over distributional justice, security over development. So in a sense, centralization, expansion of state bureaucracies, and encourage a top-down approach to management of public affairs. Most importantly, as I said, the post-independence international context was not conducive than the colonial one. Uh, as particularly in the context of East-West rivalry, conflict between within African states were intensified as a result, as each side backed their own dictators who abused their power to enrich themselves. So as the African nationalist project came to be perceived by external actors as being synonymous with uh, communism, leaders who expressed any desire to chart an independent development path were either assassinated or overthrown by Western sponsored military coup. Lumumba, Nkrumah, Sekiture, you know the story. In their place, neocolonial regimes, both civilian and military types, were imposed and were often sustained by foreign aid. Thus, barely halfway into the second decade of independence, the vision of an independent Africa had started to fall apart and the gulf between the state and society widened considerably in the process. But as Africa entered the decade of the 1980s, 1990s, a new world order has emerged that favored powerful Western nations and giant firms that are best placed to profit from the polarizing logic of world order. 
This is what Susan Strange once referred to as the rise of business civilization. Imperialism basically has changed color and modus operandi. So debt structures, conditional aid flows, and equal systems of trade became the main instrument for regulating Africa's development. The operative logic of the post-1980 political order has been that market economies give birth to democratic rule, and the latter in turn contribute to well-functioning market and, pro and prosperity for all. Following those logic, as I said, we've seen through the 90s, conditional lending became the main instrument to get African countries to open up their market, dismantle many aspects of the African state, and institute minimal democratic procedures essential for the well-functioning of the market. In the process, what is left of the development welfareism of the 1960s and 1970s were completely erased from the economic reform agenda. So policy making, an important aspect of sovereignty, has been basically taken away from the hands of African countries. Seven decades later, here we are. The role of the state in Africa as a driver of development has been significantly curtailed. The dominant of market forces is set in place, and economies have been wide open to external competition. Yet few African countries have achieved credibly in terms of any of the indicators that measure real sustainable development and instead most have slid backward into growing inequality, ecological degradation, deindustrialization and poverty. By imposing particular policy choices on poor countries, creditors basically take away government sovereignty and accountability to their own people and instead make them answerable to unaccountable external institutions for their choice of economic policies, their level of spending on public services and as a critical political decision. This is recolonization, not development. So how do we resuscitate the nationalist project? How do we move forward? I think Africa's marginal position in the new global hierarchy provides us with a compelling occasion to seek a transformative and emancipatory national development project that will create the necessary policy space. A transformative and emancipatory project will entail the need to adopt key reform at the national, regional levels with greater emphasis on what I call strategic integration of the national economy into the international economy. There are several questions I want to raise at this point. First, what is the future of the national project? How and who should resuscitate and drive the new national project that is emancipatory? Second, what is the lineup of the balance of social forces that are capable of contributing to the construction of a new emancipatory national project? Is it civil society? Is it the peasantry? Is it intellectual? Who? We need to figure that out. Third, is an African-owned, African-led development agenda possible in an environment of high level of aid dependency, endless conditionality, shrinking policy space that characterize donor-recipient relationship. What are the objective conditions that today that will permit a transformative national project to emerge? I'm not sure I'll be able to answer all of these questions today, but I'll try. So what are the preconditions for a transformative emancipatory national project? While the aborted national project of the 1960s operated within the confines of the inherited colonial order, the new transformative project is essentially a strategy for more equitable appropriation of the productive forces at the lo local, continental, and global level. Level. It involved, as I said, a deliberate intervention to strengthen national political capacity in the face of this polarizing logic of the world order, which undermines that capacity. So where do we begin? First, of course, renewing and restoring democracy in Africa, a number one project. 
not not standing remarkable progress we've seen earlier on democracy in africa is still in profound travel and has not moved beyond the holding of elections entrenched repressive structures continue to frustrate that process this is partly because democratic institutions including from legislature local government electoral bodies political parties the judiciary the media and civil society remain weak and are therefore unable to act as countervailing force to an often powerful executive branch of government makandawere referred to this phenomena as choiceless democracy so for democracy to succeed in african context there must be significant social reform a reduction of inequalities as well as the decentralization of political power and decision making so by enlarging visions raising consciousness citizens can undermine the vicious circle of mass exclusion and marginalization this will in turn of course increase the legitimacy of the state as the people will possess major decisions and feel involved in decision making so the most reliable way of getting the citizens behind a nationalist project development agenda is through democratic structures and the empowerment of people at the grassroots level so this is one of the starting point one important pillar to, to get into an emancipatory national project second will be will be uh, building a democratic developmental state so central to africa's renewal is the development of a strong democratic activist state that would assert its development role within the context of a common national vision so successful development demand a greater role of the state in the economy than neoclassical theory has assumed a competent state has a vital role to play in guiding national development ensure egalitarian distribution of resources linking urban rural production and investing in human capital formation to provide equal opportunity and upward mobility for all this has been the experience of the so-called successful east asian countries such as china india vietnam you name it in other words if the market is to function effectively it requires an elaborate state guidance the third is important pillar for me would be constructing a viable social contract underpinned by a strong social protection system so in order for democracy to succeed there must be a significant social reform so in every political system there must be a bargain in being a member of that political community a social bargain is the glue that keeps the political community together it is within this social bargain that every citizen seeks to exert accountability so there got to be some form of a social contract underpinned by a strong social protection system fourthly is here again revitalizing agricultural agricultural production and empowering the peasantry i think the disappointing economic performance of the continent over the past four decades has been caused to a large extent by the failure of african government to create a proper conditions for an agricultural revolution to take place which would in turn propel the process of industrialization of course the priority task of an agri- african agricultural revolution that will remain for several decades to come is obviously very complex and multifaceted at the minimum it requires the presence of a strong and effective enabling state with the capacity to respond to the demands of rural producers the fifth pillar would be investing on african education and basic research africa cannot flourish unless there is intellectual capital of the continent to develop and maintain an intellectual marginalization will occur unless the continent raises its educational levels and standards i think the only way to narrow the knowledge gap is by investing in education basic research and development investing in education and basic research should emphasize the need to scale up the technological ladder and tap into the global system of information and knowledge so major work has to be done in educational reform throughout the continent and finally the critical element of strategic 
alliance between business and government. Because transformational change that will move African countries forward to a different level and quality of life requires the simultaneous engagement of the three major elements of society. The private sector, a strong effective developmental state, and of course, certainly, the civil society. One key factor that contributed to the spectacular economic transformation of the East Asian countries has been the strong business government strategic alliance under the guidance of an activist developmental state. Policies are implemented through the private initiatives rather than public ownership, through the market mechanism rather than administrative control. In this regard, economic policies are formulated by a capable, pragmatic economic bureaucracy, which through formal informal ties with the private sector, develops a common vision of development objectives and target and common understanding on how this can be achieved. Finally, is the need for Africa to secure policy space by pursuing heterodox economic policies. I think developing countries need policy space to exercise institutional innovations that depart from the now discredited conventional Washington consensus. So the key to Africa in today's world is to try to weave through the parameters set by the world economy and maintain as much independence or policy space as possible. I think the lessons from China and East Asia certainly demonstrate the importance of pursuing heterodox national policies that support strategic industries, develop internal infrastructure, invest in human capital formation to provide equal opportunity and upward mobility for all, and control financial markets. So they were able to succeed for two reasons, that A, the government had the freedom to control basic economic policy, B, the state had the administrative, legal, regulatory capacity to guide the market in a way favorable to the national development. Therefore, an effective state is a prerequisite for a well-functioning market. What nation what nation states do in regard to domestic wage levels, foreign investment, public services, economic diversification can help determine to a considerable extent whether a country develops or not. Although these powers are not always simple or easy to exercise, they have by no means completely disappeared from the national arena. Let me conclude. The current development crisis provide us with new opening for activism, for social pact, public policy debate on a number of key issues aimed at reintegrating the economy and the society through democratic politics. Structural change requires the reconfiguration of the balance of social forces. In other words, social movement, labor movement, student movement, peasant movement, consumer movement in order to create genuinely redistributive structure and institutions at the local and global level. In short, I'm calling for new politics of liberation. We need a major paradigm shift, a new analytical narrative on what is to be done. Of course, the resistance will take many forms and the outcome will depend on the capacity of the forces of civil society to gain sufficient influence to qualify as genuine counter-project. Therefore, a strategy of recovery should center on transforming the production system, transforming social relations, and transforming democratic governance at the global and local levels. Central to this endeavor is the need to employ social policy as an instrument of recovery. The social question cannot be disembedded from the economy. The economy cannot be separated from the social question. To repeat, we need new politics, new analytical narratives, and what is to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fantuchero, for this inspiring lecture. And um, you have given us the roadmap, basically, also how to move forward. 
and uh, also going back to history and taking the lessons from the past on the nationalist project in Africa has been has been extremely informative and and uh, interesting for us. So thank you so much. I could make more comments about your lecture and and uh, trying to synthesize what you said, but it was so rich and I think that everyone has taken so many insights and food for, for thought from it that I would really like to open um, the space for a couple of questions and a, a short discussion on this because I'm sure you know that the many, many issues and, and, and topics and also, you know, the many recommendations of how we can create this transformative emancipatory nationalist project while also embedding it, you know, in a strategic integration of African countries and the region, the continent into a reformed global economy. And all of this, you know, built on a new type of politics and a new analytical narrative for which you know the the community we are part of the researchers the think tanks and the institutions are working very hard uh, so we have a lot of um, um, issues to talk about and i see i can't see any questions now in the q and a box and i have asked uh, people to post them there but i would like to open the floor for anyone who would like to ask a question We still have 10 minutes uh, if Professor Shero is able to take questions. I see Dennis Canterbury. Yes, please take the floor, Dennis. Dennis, your mic is off. Dennis, your mute. Oh yes, oh, sorry about that. Thank you very much, Katya, and thank you very much, Professor Chiru, for this inspiring lecture. I'm from the Caribbean, as you know, and um, in the Caribbean, everything you said seemed to be so relevant to um, what we're doing there and what's lacking and what could be done across there. So your work not only significant for the, for the continent, but also for um, us in the Caribbean. Um, I'm happy that I stayed up at this time of the night here, it's three o'clock in the morning here to listen to your lecture because it's um, it's really inspiring. But I have a comment that I wanna make, sort of a comment question. And this is um, this notion of strategic integration into the global um, economy, integrating Africa into the global economy. This idea also came up in the Caribbean about integrating the Caribbean into the global economy. And I'm saying, my, my concern is that uh, it seems as though we were already at the very center of um, international capitalism because uh, in its very formation and in terms of its very, um, its continuation, uh, Africa as well as the Caribbean are very central to this process. So I'm wondering, how are we going to be integrated into something that we were already in? And if you can possibly elaborate on this question of um, integration into the international global economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. If Professor Shero allows, I would also like to put forward three questions that come up in the chat and then ask you uh, to, 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 to give your answer to, to the four questions, if that is possible. So we also have a question from Ebena Oduro, who's, who is asking, what role is there for regional integration? What form should it take? And we have a question uh, by ATSC Marcia, who is asking, uh, how can we construct regional social policies in Africa? So there is uh, 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 a slight uh, connection between the, the two questions uh, going uh, towards the regional level. Um, and then there is a third question by Mogisha um, asking, what would you comment about the tendency by African governments to vulgarize higher education by promoting bootlicking leadership in a bid to control 
one of the most vociferous voices of civil society? And how can academics operating in such a context contribute to the vision you have outlined? So we have one question about the strategic integration of, of, uh, of developing countries, African, Caribbean, others into, into the capitalist a global economy of which they're already part. And then two questions around um, the, the regional, uh, regional integration, regional social policy, and one question uh, about higher education in Africa. So, so please, Professor Shero, if you would like to, to take these questions. Uh, I will uh, try to address them as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody else. Uh, uh, for, for Dennis, who is up there in the Caribbean, very early, uh, very important question. Uh, I think my old colleague, my late colleague, uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein was saying, you know, uh, the capitalist system is the only game in town. In a sense, you're right, we are integrated. The question is, how do we strategically uh, deal our relationship, manage that relationship in such a way uh, that the relationship, you know, become very uh, strategic uh, because we are already integrated. It is the only game in town. Within that context, how do you provide, give yourself a space uh, pursue policies that that would be in the in, in the national interest. Uh, so it, here it requires, I think, strategic integration. Also, uh, is not only what nations do at the country level. I think the second question on regional integration is very relevant here. I look at regional integration as a counter hegemonic strategy. It's one part of you know the tools you use to expand space in terms of, of an aspect of regional integration. So in a sense, I think uh, the, the choices we have through collective action, as well as through uh, the kind of strategies you will take at the national level uh, have to be strategic, have to be informed, but the, you have to be very clear in terms of what the end goal is without compromising uh, uh, the, the national uh, political decision uh, processes. These are difficult. I'm not saying this is easy to do. Uh, I can tell you just my own engagement over the last, uh, in, in a limited space, uh, context in the context of you know, the experiment of the developmental state approach strategy in Ethiopia under Mel Zanawi. I mean, it was not a perfect policy. There was some attempt then to reclaim the policy space, but of course, in not, not that everything was successful, but there was a demonstration what can be achieved. But you add that measure at a national level, complemented with also a regional approach, where you use regional integration and cooperation as a counter hegemonic strategy, you reduce the degree of vulnerabilities individual countries or you know, you know, a number of countries can come together to act. So that's the reality that we deal given the fact it is a totalizing that the capitalist system is basically the only game in town within that, how can you operate? How can you maximize? How can you avoid things that can be avoided to the risk, but also take advantage of what you can get out of it. So these are kind of a very pragmatic ways given the realities we have experimented with alternative approaches that are not uh, produced. On the third question on higher education, that is the, the biggest issue for me, uh, connected at many levels. Uh, uh, to what extent, I mean, we have literally, particularly in the continent, the state of higher education in general is pathetic. Now the universities is where, uh, uh, government have basically used it as the instrument of social control rather than as an instrument of liberation. Uh, that's one area that we also have to begin to see where the whole system of 
education system from uh, primary to particularly at the level of higher education is where it's contested, where it is uh, dealt with in such a way uh, that it undermines development, it undermines democratic aspirations, it undermines so many things in many ways that, that have not been uh, critical areas where, where uh, it has to be uh, given significant, I'm not even talking about quantity and quality issues. It is it's just a whole political economy of higher education have to be looked very seriously uh, in, in many, many ways. Without that, it's simply, it is one of the mortars that plays across sectors, across issues in our, in our politics, on, in our economy, in our social relations. That is one space that we have to also have to reclaim as quickly as possible as part of this larger emancipatory uh, project. I'm not sure I've been able to answer all of them, but generally these are bigger issues. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, res you know, relate with people. I'm sure you should be able to, to write me. I'll be very glad to communicate individually and you should be able to get my contact details from the organizers that I'll be uh, very happy to engage, to continue to engage in this in this endeavor. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Pantoshero, also for offering to continue the debate. I think you have given us so many entry points, and it aligns so well with what is going on in our institutions, also with an unrest and I guess in Kudesria and 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 the social policy chair. So thank you so much. We couldn't have you know, a better uh, first inaugural uh, uh, memorial lecture um, to, to, to debate and to remember and to take forward the rich legacy of, of our professor and director and friend and mentor, Tandika Mekandawiri. So thank you so much for this. Thank and you. With, uh, with this, uh, and again, a huge thank you to all the panelists, uh, Jimmy and Godwin for introducing um, the motivation for this lecture series for all the members of the, the Mekandawiri family for sharing their, their thoughts uh, and very personal moments uh, with Tandika uh, to all the participants who have listened and, and asked questions. And uh, I think I give a hand over to Jimmy um, um, okay. for, for guiding us through, through uh, the, the program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kaja, you know, and uh, Professor Fantucheru, um, as always, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we will uh, have the comfort break now and uh, return at uh, 10.45 uh, Central African time and the third breakaway sessions. So again, uh, people should... Uh, click on the links, uh, you know, for the specific uh, session they want to attend um, in the program. Thank you very much.